So first, let's try staccato. If you really want to go the full length and experiment in every position, you will find even more varieties. So for instance, staccato in first position, fifth, ninth, tasto. Ponticello. And now, same thing, but legato, first neutral. Tasto. And Ponticello. As you will notice, each has its own character and it has its own feel. And the amount of time that is needed for staccato, legato, long and short, that all should be taken into account depending on which position you're playing in. Because sometimes it is harder to play in a color in certain positions. So keep that in mind. Just be aware of any tension that you may or may not have as you're playing. Let's see what staccato and legato notes look like with different articulations with our paintbrush. Da, 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 da. Now what happens if I increase the flexion of this tip joint of the brush? Da, 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 da. Because the longer flexion um, takes more time, doesn't quite work with the staccato stroke. That's the same exact thing with the guitar as well. Okay. Now let's see what staccato might look like with a very, very fast, or if barely at all, flexion. There is less contact of the paintbrush when I am doing a very fast flexion. I get less. If you think about it in the same way with your tip joint, this can help you make some informed decisions about your playing. For a legato, I'm thinking I want them long and connected together with as little space as possible in between. No, no. In this one, I wasn't really considering any sort of flexion, and I was just first trying out my paintbrush. If you notice, I'm getting different shapes as a result. So now let's be a little bit more methodical so we can try to get more consistency between our strokes, just like guitar. Okay, so first what we're going to do is a neutral or mezzo um, in between long and short when it comes to the flexion. Generally more consistent. I did have to switch sides of my paintbrush to get enough color um, to finish and that is why there is that little discrepancy in shape in that particular spot. However, you might consider something like this to happen with your guitar. For instance, this might be a spot where you were changing positions. Yeah, and then you would have to maybe adjust. Now let's think about a long flexion and see what kind of result that gives us. So in this case, I'm actually seeing more consistency. If you notice, there is definitely a difference in thickness when it comes to that flexion, which actually gave me more consistent results with my legato sounds. I would say it's very similar with guitar playing as well. I think legato, long, that gives you more room to breathe 
and also being able to do longer follow-throughs and flexions. Staccato, you don't always have that time, as you can see, that can lead to less control. Last but not least, let's just try the staccato. It was harder for me to connect those strokes as the other examples. If I want legato, I want all of those to be connected together. So like guitar, a fast flexion when you are trying to do legato will give you a really particular picture and sound. Keep that in mind as you are working. All of this understanding will help give your music expression and direction. Pay attention to and adhere to all the composer's directions and articulation, little dots for staccato or slur markings for legato. In conclusion, I hope this gives you some new ideas to explore with your music. Hello, and welcome to part two of creating an informed performance. From the very start, I need to stress that in this video, I am just merely skimming the surface of a few ideas to help widen your perspective. As always, I strongly encourage you to do your own research, make your own discoveries, and see how you can integrate them into your own playing. One thing that I have learnt the further you dive down the rabbit hole, the higher the chance you will find information that contradicts your thesis, which will bring you back to stage one. Even if this happens, you will be enriched by the possibilities that this knowledge brings you, especially if you can apply it to other facets of your musical journey. I've attached a glossary of terms that I will be using throughout this video. Feel free to click on the PDF and read through them. Let me take you back to two pinnacles of the Renaissance. Machaut's Messe de Notre Dame, composed around 1365, which you heard a little of at the beginning of this video, and the Missa Pangolingua by Josquin Duprez, composed around 1515. Although these two pieces are separated by 150 years, they have a lot of similarities in terms of style and purpose. Let us enter the sound world of the Renaissance. Let's take a broad look at the overall landscape of what we just heard. Although we only heard a short excerpt of each piece, First and foremost, it is vital to understand that a vast majority of this music at this time was written for one purpose and one purpose only. For the church, for the glory of God. The creation of the pitches themselves grew outwards from something called the cantus firmus. Multiple musical lines were layered vertically on top of one another. This stacking of the multiple lines created polyphony and became the most predominant method of composition of the Renaissance. This means that the melody was not always distinct or clear. Certain musical lines unexpectedly pop out. Sometimes you have a musical line which is disturbed by another. And it is challenging for the ear to stay fixated on one idea. You may also have heard the wide variety of timbres within these multiple voices. What you are most likely hearing is a difference in timbre based on the use of various vowels. Each vowel produces its own set of particular frequencies. Some can sound rather nasal, others piercing, and yet others warm. To understand this, just sing the vowels out loud and listen to the different timbres you create. Finally, you may have heard a strangeness in the phrase structure, a certain lack of pulse. It can seem as if there is no time signature. Fast moving vocal lines or melismas sound like improvisation, a wonderful characteristic trait of this period. If you are willing, take a minute and go back to the beginning of this video. Tap along 
and try to find the meter in downbeats. Why does this all matter in playing the guitar? I think many of us can agree that the early guitar-like instruments, the lute, the vihuela, were recognized more for entertainment or secular purposes rather than sacred. But it's more important to note that secular music absorbed many of the techniques of sacred music. For me, one of the guiding lights of Renaissance polyphony will always be the massive compendium of secular works for the vihuela by Milan, the magnificent El Maestro. Looking at the score of his first Fantasia, we see all of the same musical traits we heard in the Machot and the Duprez. There is polyphony, multiple lines which seem to take over, which I've highlighted with different colors. And you can see instead of a predominant musical line, the moving line jumps from voice to voice. We can allocate various timbre and color to these lines. Looking at the first 19 measures, we find an incredibly unusual phrase structure, which distorts the meter and pulse of the composition. So with the fantasy in number one, let's just follow as a starting point, the moving musical line, and let's allocate certain timbres to it as well. So at the beginning, the moving line is in the lower voice. on that accidental of the C sharp resolving to the D. The interest back to the lower voice. Then the accidental of the G sharp moving to the A. Then the interest is in the lower voice. Let's allocate a certain timbre. Then the interest in the upper voice and different timbre, maybe Ponticello. to a different color in the bass, then the interest is in the middle voice, lower voice, then the middle voice with the suspension to the resolution. One musical genre of the period to actively depart from the sacred style of composition was the Italian-based theme and variation. And within our guitar repertoire, perhaps one of the most notable theme and variations is the Guadamil Las Vacas, Safe Keep the Cows for Me, by Narvaez. I want to reiterate that I do not believe this is the only correct way to perform this piece. This is how I look at this piece, how I use the concepts of history as a guide to create interpretive opportunities while I play it. Even before starting a piece of music, learn about the composer. Who influenced the composer? Where does this particular music fall within their catalogue of music? In a nutshell, his most important surviving music exists in six volumes. The Guatemala Sparkus falls within his last volume. Interestingly, while perusing the catalogue, Notice that his third volume is dedicated exclusively to arrangements from other composers. Most importantly, none other than Josquin Duprez. Coincidence? I think not. When most people perform the opening of this piece, the general consensus is to create a nice, beautiful and flowing musical line. Usually performing this with a 6-4 feel, with a small emphasis on the first and fourth beats. This gives the piece a nice feel and flow. It's beautiful, it makes sense. Sounds almost like a pastoral scene with cows grazing in the lush green grass. But what this also does is create an emphasis on the idea of melody from the outset. What happens if we mix it up a little? 
If we recognize the dichotomy and interplay between the 6-4 and the 3-2 time signatures, this actually creates a very different feel in the opening passage. Delving deeper, early tablature of this piece suggests the entire piece being in a duple feel. So, full disclosure, even this idea I'm suggesting departs slightly from what may have been heard in the region of Spain's courts. Let's really emphasize the difference in the subdivision of the measures between three and two. Three. So with the variation one, we can now really focus on incorporating the timbres. Of course, we could also incorporate the timbres in the opening theme as well. But this is just a great way of showing you how we can utilize all these different colors on the guitar. Variation one, let's start with a normal. Then we can move to a ponticello to allocate the next vocal line. Then back to the normal. Then we can do a tasto. Then back to the normal. Then to a ponticello. Into a normal. Of course, we can do all of these timbres in different ways. I mean, we can start off with a ponticello. Then move to a dolce. Etc. Etc but do whatever you think sounds natural and tasteful. Whenever I do play this piece, I'm overjoyed that even the simplest of ideas give a new interpretation to audiences, one that is rooted in Renaissance techniques. It even enhances our modern day understanding of Spanish music. We think about characteristics that are inherently Spanish, and even back in 1538, the blood of the Spanish rhythm ran thick through their veins. Consider what the ramifications are of the relationship between 6-4 and 3-2. It reminds us of the accents created by the hemiola and the vitality of flamenco. In this brief video, I hope I've offered you a snapshot of how we can uncover different musical opportunities in this particular piece. Looking at the music of other Renaissance greats, like the poetic forms of Dowland, may present a completely different set of parameters. In last week's introduction to this series, I mentioned that interpretation comes down to personal taste. Some people will enjoy an approach like this, some may not. For me, incorporating what I have learned from the popular music of the time gives me the chance to rediscover old ways that these pieces may have been played. So if you have, or maybe you currently are thinking about becoming a professional musician, chances are you've heard from somebody that there are no jobs in music. And what I want to tell you in this video is that they're kind of right, but they're also kind of wrong. Yes, making a living as a musician is very difficult. Yes, there are a lot less jobs in music. But in a way, there's also more jobs for musicians than there are for other fields of work. The reason why this is is because as a musician, there's so many different things that you can do. Yes, everybody thinks of things such as playing concerts and teaching lessons, and those are pretty common. But there's also things such as playing for musicals, or playing for weddings, or maybe playing in restaurants or art galleries maybe working as a session musician, maybe even working in a church, whether it's the same one every single week or maybe a different one every single week. Either way, there's tons of opportunities out there. So when people say there's no jobs in music, I think what they mean is there's not a job that is just lying out there when you graduate right to say, hey, you have a degree in music, here's the job that I want you to do, it pays this much a year, and you're set for however long you want to keep that job. Because it definitely does not work that way. When you're a musician, you don't really ever have a job. You can but many of the times you have a career. And that career can shape, grow, get smaller, get bigger, depending on what you make of it over the course of time. But that's all up to you and the work that you put in there. Because there may be no jobs music, 
you have to go find your own job. You have to go create your own job. You have to go build your own job. So the first thing I wanna talk about is how to find work. So the first thing I'll say is don't expect a job to come to you. You have to go find it. And that could be as simple as just asking. Finding someone and saying, hey, have you ever considered having this thing here? Whether that's live music, live guitar, whatever it is, and see what they say. Worst they can say is no, best they can say is why don't we give it a try? And then maybe you got your first job. The next thing I would say would be to be open to playing various kinds of music. Don't not do something just because you feel as though it might be beneath you, right? So if you're going to school for, let's say, classical or maybe jazz, don't think that you're not going to have a gig playing pop music at a wedding or a private party on the weekends. That might be the only gig that you can get, and you never know who you might meet at those gigs. And trust me, most people in their careers have done that kind of thing at one point or another, and who knows, you might actually really like doing that, so give it a try. So along the same lines of doing things that you may or may not have been expecting to do in your career, you never know who you're gonna meet at those kinds of things. So be ready to network. If you don't know anybody, nobody's gonna ask you or refer you for different kinds of work. For all of you know, you might be playing a gig at a wedding or a restaurant and someone there that's also a musician might hear you and think, wow, you know, this person's really good and I think it'd be great to have them play with me sometime at my next gig. Or maybe they have a gig they can't do and they think, wow, this person would be a great substitute for me. Either way, I would suggest putting in 100%, 100% of the time because you never know who's listening. So when you're out there doing the thing you always wanted to do, or maybe you're doing the thing that you never wanted to do, either way, you need to know how to network. And networking is huge as a musician. If you don't network, nobody's gonna know who you are, nobody's gonna know what you do, and nobody's gonna be able to refer you to things that they think you could do because nobody knows who you are. My personal recommendation would be to network with everyone that you can because you never know who knows somebody else. And even if you don't like them, they could be a great connection to have, unfortunately. Now, when you do connect with somebody, you need to have your things together. You need something that you can show them so that way they can check you out later that night or even share your information with someone else that they know that might be interested in that kind of service. In my opinion, having a good Instagram and or YouTube channel is just as important as having an electronic press kit. And yes, I would recommend to have one of those as well to hold your resume, your cover letter, and maybe some testimonials. But having good social media accounts is huge because they're so easy to access. People don't have to go digging through papers to find out more about you. They just open their phone and look up your name and there you are. Okay, so let's say that you finally got a shot. Maybe it's a gig and you're subbing for somebody or maybe it's a teaching position that they want to try you out as a new teacher. Either way, you need to know how to get called back. And believe it or not, getting called back isn't all about showing up and being the best musician in the room. Honestly, that's probably the least important thing. It's important, but these things are more important. Number one, you need to show up on time. Nobody's gonna care if you show up and you're the best player there if you show up late. It's kind of like the old saying goes, if you're on time, then you're late, and if you're early, you're on time. That is so true as a musician. Number two, you need to show up prepared. Now this one might seem obvious, but there's tons of times that people show up for a gig or some kind of work-related thing, and they're not ready. And that leaves a huge bad impression on whoever they're working for, and chances are they're not gonna get called back, so don't be that person. Number three, you need to be easy to reach. So this means being way more on top of your emails, your text messages, and your phone calls. Because sometimes getting work or not getting work can be a matter of answering the phone 10 minutes before somebody else and finding out that you were the first call, but because you didn't answer, somebody else already got the job. It happens and you don't want that to be you. Number four is you need to be flexible. You don't want to be the person that says yes to everything, but you also don't want to be the person that says no to everything. Because if you are, you end up in this little niche where you only get called sometimes when they need that very specific thing. And that very specific thing might not happen all too much. So what I would recommend would be to be honest. You know, worst comes to worst is you can't do the thing they asked you to do, but at least you're honest about it, you gave it a shot, and they saw that you're not that person for the job. But to me, that's a lot better than never being called just because people might assume that you're not gonna be open to doing that thing that for all you know, you might actually be really good at. Number five, I personally think is the most important one, and that is don't be a jerk. You can be the best guitar player in the whole entire state, but if you're a jerk, nobody's gonna to wanna to work with you, nobody's gonna to wanna to hire you, nobody's gonna to wanna to recommend you, and nobody's gonna even really wanna be associated with you. And the thing is, you could be the best one out there, and chances are there's tons of people that are just as good as you are, maybe a little less good, but if they're much nicer, they're gonna get the calls of you. That's just how it is. So to sum all this up, being a professional musician isn't easy. You're constantly working to work, there isn't that much work out there. The work that is out there most of the time doesn't pay all that much, and there's tons of people all looking for the same exact job. But if this is something that you love to do, and you're open to doing more than one thing, such as teaching during the week, playing weddings on Friday and Saturday nights, and playing church services in the morning, then yeah, I think you can definitely make a living as a musician. Like most things in life, you have to start somewhere, and when it comes to being a professional musician, there's no clear path to success. So go out there, make your connections, create opportunities, 
be a decent human being, and over time, I'm sure you'll start to find work coming in. I hope you found this helpful, and thanks so much for watching.